Welcome to lecture number five, Geology 2017. Uh, in this uh, lecture, we are going to talk about uh, viscosity, especially in the beginning. So we will review uh, this important characteristic of magmas and uh, a variety really of uh, products that are related to volcanic activity will be influenced by, by, by viscosity. We'll see that. Uh, so to essentially connect to the previous lectures, we, we've been dealing with uh, this idea of looking at different uh, rocks, uh, mostly intrusive or plutonic rocks, uh, uh, were evaluated and we uh, sort of add an overview of the minerals that are associated with igneous rocks. So we will see today that some of these minerals like silicate have or bear a strong influence on, on the behavior or the physical or mechanical behavior of, of um, the magma. So, and this is really linked to this idea of, of viscosity, how viscosity can control uh, how essentially a magma flow is, is, is a critical uh, factor. So the objective of the lecture today is to firstly place uh, some of the key physical concepts together, show some basic examples of the effect of, of, of magmas uh, uh, percolating through rocks, uh, and uh, also look at subaerial products. Uh, so quite often magmatism near surface uh, will have a big impact on the surrounding rocks but also will change the geomorphological aspects of a land especially if you have a lot of products that are emitted for example from a volcano they will accumulate at certain sites they will manifest in the form of lavas and also they will essentially control the morphology of land uh, quite significantly through the development of rifts, for example, or uh, lava channels, uh, all sorts of different things. Or in some cases, you might have that the volcano sort of erupts, uh, ejecta, so cinerites, uh, lapilli, bombs, uh, all those sort of products. Uh, and so we are going to look at how these products can influence the morphology of a volcanic cone and uh, how it impacts uh, um, in essence the uh, life of humans uh, as well as uh, the constructions and buildings uh, that uh, happen to be constructed in the vicinity of, of a volcano okay so that's key uh, a key aspect really of interest to engineers that are dealing with risk mitigation strategies they will need to understand the type of volcanic products that are uh, essentially ejected from 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 different types of volcanoes and this connects with the next lecture which will uh, is going to look at uh, really the different types of volcanoes and and the, the differences in activity of the volcanoes so we start to think about viscosity we can think of it as an intrinsic property of a magma that will control again size and shape of of a magmatic chamber so the shape that, uh, how actually the magmatic chamber form will be a function of a relationship between the surrounding rocks and the magma itself and so there is a contrast in, uh, for example, the compet com competency or density contrast will favor the uh, either deformation of, of the surrounding rocks or uh, we will have magmas that tend to infiltrate the rocks. So these are all aspects that are, that are critical and are related to a number of things, for example, the rate at which the magma rises and also they will influence as i stated the structural behavior so the response of the ostrox uh, that um, essentially are um, subject to these uh, uh, magmatic flows 
So lithostratigraphic pressure conditions, so the relationship of pressure, which is commonly lithosta lithostatic pressure, and uh, the force of the uh, magma plume uh, will be exerting really a control on the behavior of, of the magmas, as we will see. And other things are temperature contrast, so is it the surrounding rock really cool, cool or hot, or does it have the same temperature? Uh, these are also important factors that mostly regulate the type of crystallization that you have at the boundaries of, of a magmatic chamber. Uh, so these can result, for example, in chill margins where you have uh, much uh, finer grain crystallization uh, on the edge of, of a chamber. If we look at the, some, some basic graphics here, it, it's going to just show the effect of, of uh, a number of factors on viscosity. Okay, so on the y-axis you have the logarithm of the viscosity expressed in poise and this is number that goes from 2 to 10 or 2 to 5 roughly and, and they give you an indication of, of the level of viscosity which means essentially that uh, uh, if you have an index that is for example 10 it will be highly viscous so a highly viscous material usually offer more resistance to flow so it's harder to make it flow basically you can think of something that is very low viscosity as water, for example. If you leave uh, a drop of water at rest, it's going to flatten out. And that's the, the idea. If, if uh, a fluid is not really viscous, it's going to flow quite easily. Instead, let's drop uh, uh, maybe some oil. It's going to be harder for the oil to move and in fact you can see that it adapts to any surface much more slowly okay a slow slow adaption of, of shape will be uh, correlated directly with uh, uh, viscosity so a higher viscosity is something that is more plastic uh, it's harder to move around basically an example is here for, for silica. So let's say we increase the percentage of silica and we go from, from olivine basalt to classic basalt, andesite dacite and rhyolites. And we have also different temperature ranges here. But let's say we, we pick the 1200 degree temperature as a constant. Uh, what happens is that you have a, la a linear relationship. You can see a line there that increases uh, proportionally to silica so you have that viscosity will increase uh, with the percentage of silica in the magma and since we were looking at different names of rocks there we know that the rhyolite will have quite a bit more silica if compared to an ultramafic rock for example you take a precritic basalt so very close to an ultramafic rock it will have much less uh, silica we saw that previously in our classifications well that has a direct implication in terms of viscosity okay so the higher the silica and the higher will be the viscosity why is that uh, it's because silicates tend to develop polymers uh, so we saw uh, in i believe in the second or first lecture that we were talking about uh, different types of silicates um, and we saw that we can form chain silicates uh, so pyroxenes or amphiboles so ribbon-like structures are quite common when we form silicates um, especially in crustal conditions so let's say we increase the number of chains um, this is a process called polymerization so you form a lot of polymers and those usually have a higher strength because of the bonds you form in these chains and this increases the, capa the capacity of the fluid actually decreases the capacity of the fluid to flow so automatically it increases the viscosity so the more silica we have the more polymerization can take place the viscous will be our uh, magma okay Lack of viscosity for temperature this is quite obvious uh, it's easier to solidify a magma and increase the number of polymers uh, when you heat up the magma uh, 
you are breaking bonds so because of the increase in temperature because you are increasing the entropy of that uh, magma so you go from a, from a solid into a whole liquid and so you can see in this diagram mm, the idea of increasing crystallization by slowing down thing, things, uh, so reducing temperature, so reducing entropy. This causes a break, so when you start to form uh, a solid, uh, you crystallize efficiently your magma, you have a sudden drop uh, in uh, um, temperature and uh, this leads to an increase uh, of significant increase in, in viscosity because of that. So the beginning of the crystallization essentially marks a two-phase process with uh, a relationship that is initially linear. You see that when we have everything that is liquid, so a magma that is very high in temperature, so 1400 degrees up to roughly 1250, then I start to crystallize and I get into exponential, an exponential relationship and uh, I basically have a non-linear model there that shows a sharp increase in viscosity with crystallization. In this other example here with the water, water we saw it's a polar, polar substance that can uh, essentially lower the uh, temperature of melting well, this has also an implication for the viscosity. So the more water as a perc weight percent I have in my, my magma, uh, the more likely is going to drop in terms of viscosity. And, and you can see that it's going from eight when you have no water down to, to roughly four. So you can alpha essentially the log of the viscosity if you add a minimum of 10% water in your magma. Of course this has uh, also a, a relationship with uh, density so quite often when you are adapt we saw that we have an increase in density because we have higher lithostatic pressures so in this diagram you can see pressure on on your left side going from 0 to 20 kilobars and that's matched by a depth variation that goes from surface down to over 60 k's all right and uh, at the bottom on the x-axis we have a density change so we saw the classical average crystal uh, value of 2.6 for granites and we could go down to ranges of roughly 3 or up to, to 3.2 for peridotites uh, which are the main source of mantle magmas and straight away we can realize that uh, an ultramafic melt, for example, will start at, at a much lower density in terms of crystallization. Uh, you can see the ultramafic melts highlighted in here. Of course, uh, while a, a, a melt that has a, a, a situation of this type, so starting from roughly 3. Point, uh, let's say almost. Uh, 3.1 or actually a bit less than that it would be on the order of 3.01 likely in terms of density well that's already quite a bit low if compared to the 3.2 of the peridotites so a mantle composition usually when you start melting the mantle the percentage of melt developed will, will have a much lower density and this triggers a process of, of in which your magma will try to rise to the mantle and enter the continental crust. And you can see here a comparison of how the density changes progressively with the fractionation of that, uh, that magma. So you start to produce gabbros and then you produce diorites. Uh, and then you might have other melting that, that takes place depending on, on the level of, of uh, uh, mixing you have. So depending on the type of magmas, so let's say we go further up, uh, if we take a mid-oceanic ridge basalt, uh, usually these melts have even uh, lower, begin, they begin with even lower density and this will allow them to fractionate, to uh, 
uh, even shallower levels in the crust. So the idea is that you have different uh, crust compositions and they will have different densities. So depending on the type of melt, you end up having that the melt has different rising capacity and it will equilibrate at different levels, which essentially supports the idea that you have different levels at which you form magmatic chambers in the crust. Another aspect I think it's critical to discuss is, is the uh, different behavior of uh, uh, intrusions uh, depending on their starting composition. So if you have basaltic intrusions, usually they behave like a fluid, so they're more, more fluid and they will tend to pervasively uh, infiltrate in, uh, um, in a host rock. So let's say you have a host rock that is highly fractured. Well, if you have a basaltic magma, in that case, you will start to form dikes and seals. So you will pervasively infiltrate uh, an existing mass of rock that is deformed and has this sort of brittle fracturing that can be filled with, uh, with basaltic magmas. Instead, if you have a magma that is more granitic in composition, so a more evolved magma, this will have much more silica in it. And as a consequence of that, it's much harder to move it around and it's usually uh, behaving with the ductile to viscoplastic uh, uh, behavior. So the rheology is completely different. It's, it's much more slow, but at the same time, it can actually deform the surrounding rock. And so you have that, uh, the viscosity contrast, uh, it's gonna be just a few orders of magnitude, uh, meaning that the inertia of uh, a magmatic chamber that is evolving and moving essentially within a host uh, can have a big, big impact in terms of deforming and, and this ends up uh, producing things like diapers, uh, which are uh, commonly uh, seen also in salt tectonic. So you form these mushroom structures uh, that deform and fractures all, all the surrounding host rock. Of course, this process is much slower. So it takes, you know, ascent velocity of, of 0 0.1 to 50 meters per year. So it's, it's much slower compared to a basaltic flow that would uh, uh, essentially travel at uh, a second, so meter per second, so much faster. So 0 0.1 to 1 meter per second could be a lava that is basaltic in composition. Here we talk about, in, in, in the case of, of granitic rocks, we talk about millions, sorry, meters per year. Okay, so time for, for magma ascent hours to days for obvious reason because of the velocity here we talk about again on the order of hundred thousand years up to a million year i would say so factors controlling the ascent velocity again viscosity and density contrast will be key and in this case we form you know dikes of variable thickness country rock has ductile strength because of the slow velocity of this you can actually deform ductile the rocks and so you form you know diapers uh, which are quite quite common effect of state of stress on on the path of the magma transport uh, in this case you tend to have more sheeted dikes uh, so everything is more flattened and can can be later, move laterally quite significantly and in fact you form very large seal complexes when you have a basalt. Sometimes they can exceed the hundreds of kilometers really so it can be quite huge uh, the footprint of uh, large plateaus that form uh, in, in uh, basaltic provinces. This is due partly to the fact that you have multiple feeders forming. Instead when you are working with the uh, 
granitic, magma, so uh, they, they tend to be much narrower pipe-like uh, bodies uh, uh, that will be on the order of, you know, uh, maybe a kilometer or on the order of two to five kilometers, uh, although even granitic provinces can develop, uh, especially along subduction zones, uh, and so you can have batolitic provinces that extends really for thousands of kilometers. Uh, but again, this is more the result of multiple injections of magma all along a subduction trend. So the country rock deformation, as I stated, is very minimal in, in a basalt. So it, it's, it's going to open up some fractures uh, but, uh, uh, and fill the fractures, but uh, uh, it's basically exploiting pre-existing structural discontinuities. Instead, here on, on the granitic case, uh, we have, you know, substantial penetrative ductile deformation taking place. Uh, and, and so the uh, movement of mass is much larger uh, if compared to, to this basalt infiltration. Uh, no magmatic example, hydrothermal quartz veins. So we can fill fractures with a variety of cements. Uh, including carbonates or quartz veins and this is what I've mentioned already the salt dome example so if we put some of these ideas into paper in a graph you can see here uh, a good diagram that illustrates uh, a change really in uh, stress state or pressure of uh, fluids uh, in equilibrium with the surrounding rocks uh, for different depths uh, and this looks like a linear relationship uh, however we have to be sort of careful with this and look essentially at uh, the different pressure changes that takes place uh, uh, in in a magma that is in equilibrium with with the surrounding rocks uh, if we look at uh, the symbology very quickly we got Sigma that stands for stress, uh, usually it's a vector and it's applied to an area. So it's equivalent to a pressure. So P stands for uh, the host rock pressure or the column of rocks that uh, stands essentially above a specified location will define my lithostatic pressure. This is in equilibrium with the pressure of the magma which is indicated with this P with underscript M. And it's an interesting relationship here. We can see that the density of the magma is directly related uh, or directly proportional to, to the pressure of the magma. So the larger the density, the larger will be the pressure. Uh, and this is also a function of gravity and uh, the depth Z at which I am located uh, so in this diagram, we, we assume essentially that uh, we start in a condition of equilibrium in which the pressure of the magma is equal to the lithostatic uh, pressure, which is uh, the result of, of essentially all different uh, uh, deviatoric stresses. Okay, So the, uh, uh, we assume that we have uh, equal stress in all directions, basically. And that's your lithostatic pressure. When we rise, of course, we are decreasing progressively the uh, pressure condition. And this is why you have a linear trend here. And this is your lithostatic pressure. And that's your pressure on the magma, which is different at some stage. So you have a situation essentially in which uh, there is magma over pressuring. And this is linked of course to the temperature of the magma which is much higher than the surrounding rocks and uh, the fact that also the magma is rising will uh, create an imbalance so quite often the excessive pressure will lead to the magma buoyancy and so you have uh, essentially a, a magma column that is progressively rising through the crust. So we have a couple of examples here. One is an extensional example in which your stress regime 
is essentially looking at a sigma 1 with a vertical component and sigma 2 and sigma 3 as horizontal components of the stress. And the same is true for the compressional case. But in this case, the sigma 1 is actually quite, quite uh, uh, strong if compared to the sigma 2 and sigma 3 because we are in extensional conditions. We, we are, it's like we are pulling apart the sides of this volcano. And instead, in this case, we are compressing things. So we are pushing things from the sides, uh, and so the vertical component becomes much smaller. So that's the key idea, and that's translated in this separation of the lithostatic stress into nonlinear trends. Uh, and uh, we have essentially that uh, when uh, we have an extensional condition, we have a sharp uh, lowering of the pressure, of the confining pressures. Um, and here we have a sharp increase of confining, confining pressures due to the tectonics. Uh, and this is related to the transition you know, from ductile behavior to brittle behavior because you have much more fracturing and uh, uh, is, this usually reduces the confining pressure. Okay, being said this, uh, we need to look at the interactions between pressures now, so the pressure of the magma and, and the pressures exerted by, by the stress field. And you can see here that if we rise above the ductile brittle condition, we essentially have an intersection. So in the compression case, uh, this intersection render us in a condition that is equivalent to the static condition in which we had that the pressure of the magma is equal to the lithostatic pressure. And this is a, a point of equilibrium that will tend to create a process called magma ponding. And so if you follow this line, you can see that in this case, we stop the rise of the magma and we tend to form seal-like bodies that are more extending. So you can see how the relationship between stress regimes, so the pressure conditions and the pressure of the magma can change the behavior of a, a, a magma column. And so you have that in this first extensional case, we tend to have magmas that rise above and uh, are becoming subaerial and they create because of that a range of products which could include lava flows, pyroclastic flows, ejecta of variable natural composition may form and they lead to the formation of a volcanic cone quite often. Instead in this other case, in the compressional case, we actually stop the magma column at a specific depth which is the transition between ductile and brittle domains and we start to crystallize uh, uh, this magma. So how do we progress further? We need further magma differentiation to increase the pressure of the magma even further and so that you can pass this barrier and, and start to, to produce uh, vertical fissures again and propagate the magma upward. So there will be a need for further fractionation to be able to break this equilibrium state and have the magma rising. So these are important relationships that uh, it's, it's worth keeping in mind. So remember the viscosity of the magma is key but also the density and as a consequence of that the relationship between the pressure of the magma and the pressure of the surrounding rocks or lithostatic pressure. We continue the discussion by looking at uh, the scale of the magmatic systems uh, and uh, we give an example of diaperism. So in this first image you can see a small intrusion on the order of 10 kilometers. They often form these mushroom style shapes uh, which have essentially a very thin uh, feeder system uh, that is connected to uh, uh, the top of the mushroom basically. So usually a thinner body that extends laterally. The same is, is here a comparison with 
with something different. So here we are looking at the salt dome. So quite often in um, for provinces famous for, for uh, ex exploitation of oil, like Texas, will have this type of architecture. So you often have sedimentary basins that uh, manifest salt diaperism. And the behavior is plastic. The salt behaves plastically, but as so much inertia that it tends to deform significantly the surrounding rocks and develops a number of uh, uh, structures uh, which are faults or breakages that will essentially lead the ostrach to adapt to the movement of the salt dome, the upward movement of the salt dome. Quite often these are important traps for, for hydrocarbon because you have that uh, at the top of uh, the salt dome, the deformation that you induce generates a permeability system that is quite uh, uh, favorable for hosting uh, accumulations of hydrocarbon that escape uh, from uh, ad adjacent uh, shale formations which are commonly the source rocks uh, for the hydrocarbons. So that's just an example to give you uh, an idea. Of course, if an intrusive uh, follows a similar type of process, it will generate similar type of deformation and you will have that the host is actually adapting to the movement of, of the intrusive because the intrusive is very silicic uh, and so it's behaving plastically and over 100,000 years it will lead to deformations of this type uh, which commonly form anticlines. Uh, um, another example down here again to answer this question about scale you can see the comparison so 10 kilometers here and 10 kilometer also down in this model you have a bunch of metamorphic rocks at the bottom and then form essentially if a very large botolith, which is probably the results of multiple feeders, uh, and it will lead essentially to a two phase magmatism. You have an intrusive that is very large, and on top, some uh, additional sub aerial products, which are coeval volcanics. Sometimes you will have the depressurization that takes place, and so you can form calderas uh, in these systems which often are quite silicic as well. Another example here of the effect of viscosity on uh, large volcanoes. Uh, these are shield volcanoes so often and we will talk about them in the future we have to deal with um, activities that are more hotspot like uh, and we mentioned that previously as well. So we were talking about Hawaiian volcanoes and how um, they develop over time, as this is one of the key tectonic environments where we have magmatism. So hot spots will produce usually ultramafic to mafic magmas, uh, which tend to have uh, um, a very low viscosity. And this uh, is exemplified by the size of these volcanoes. They tend to extend uh, for uh, hundreds of kilometers. So you can see here a comparison of scale of uh, uh, an Hawaiian volcano, so the Mauna Loa, versus a number of other uh, act volcanic activities, uh, so the Mount Rainier, Lassen Peak in, in California, and uh, also the sunset crater. So we got a composite volcano here, a dome, a cinder cone. In this case we don't have enough elements to discuss the differences really but uh, keep in mind that these volcanoes contain lavas that are much more silicic in composition so they tend to expand laterally uh, several order of magnitude less if compared to the Mahuna Loa example. So usually lower with viscosity will match essentially larger and wider accumulations of, of lavas uh, 
that uh, find these extremes that are uh, you know similar in shape to the warrior shield and so they are commonly called a shield volcano so shield volcanoes are usually hot spot related uh, uh, there is also another process that takes place in, in these volcanoes that justifies the extension, which is the principle of keeping the magmas hot and adapt while they move away from, from the central feeder system. So if you have a magma that is rising through a, a central feeder, sometimes uh, you form a lava lake at the top and you have some ejection of lavas, but that's not the only single type of process that will take uh, lava from the center outward. So lava flows. Uh, um, we can form also tunnels uh, or channels of lava adapt, uh, which exploits um, the contact between the crust and, and the cone of the volcano. And so these will move laterally as well, but the lava, because of the shielding, uh, remains hot and so she can travel extensively for hundreds of kilometers until you get a situation in which it breaks the shield and erupts into lava form on the flank of the volcano and that that's essentially a flank eruption so a lava flow on a shield volcano can travel undisturbed along a lateral fissure leading to flank eruptions so, and these have different types of products, but most of the products would be scoria cones, so small cones can form on the sides. And as I, as I mentioned, lava flows will, will be also dominant because of, of the lowest viscosity. And also the gassing is quite common, both at the top and also these flank eruptions. So venting of fumaroles, Will take place. Another type of products that uh, is, is quite common are these pressure ridges. So often you can shield the lava flow by forming a crust on top. So this is like a crunchy crust uh, that is made up of small blocks of basaltic lava and uh, with uh, an increase in viscosity, if you remember, we mentioned that the temperature is controlling viscosity. So the lower the temperature, the higher will be the viscosity. So if this crust behaves plastically, often with, with the pressure range, you tend to have that uh, you have a feeder that progressively form a bubble-like geometry. So it's going to swell, basically and form these radial cracks in response to the cooling process uh, because it happens while the magma is also exposed, exposed for, from this uh, feeder. And so this is a principle by which you form progressively uh, lava channels or lava tubes uh, uh, that flow underneath this crust. So you have here a couple of examples. Uh, one. Uh, uh, is a set of radial cracks uh, that form on these swells, uh, so on these pressure ridges, uh, with uh, a, a vulcanology here for scale. So these are pretty large fractures uh, that extends for several meters and also can can be quite large and wide, so several tens of meters is, in, in some cases. The same applies for this lava tube so you have to imagine that uh, there was a constant flow of lava percolating through this channel one feature that is worth mentioning for these uh, caves uh, is that uh, they can occur also in relatively silicic magmas uh, so not only basaltic magmas and in fact uh, this is an example from uh, the big obsidian flow in um, in Oregon. So this was uh, an event that uh, was triggered roughly 13, 1300 years ago and it was characterized by a mixture really of um, 
lava and also other tephra or ejecta uh, that traveled quite extensively in fact i remember some some of them reached uh, uh, the idaho uh, so the border with the oregon and idaho and um, you had essentially thicknesses of tephra that uh, were on the order of a few millimeters uh, in those areas uh, proximal to the eruption site instead uh, thicknesses and, and lava flows exceeded uh, several tens of feet uh, uh, so several meters on the order of 20 to 30 meters okay if we move on to the next example here you have uh, highly lobated and very large scale examples of uh, the inflation process so it's not exclusively a local um, sort of phenomena uh, often uh, when you have uh, basaltic flows that are quite extensive like this example here extends uh, for more than uh, 10 kilometers i would say uh, and uh, yeah it's it's quite interesting to see uh, the topography or the more geomorphological aspects of of these in fact some some of these Morphologies are also have, have also been detected in other planets uh, such as the Moon and Mars. So it's relatively important for us to understand how the lava develops. Uh, and uh, in this particular example, you can also see these lobes here and here that protrude for extensive distances. And they can also form a curved channel. So, so quite often it's the basaltic lava that cannot, cannot really move as easily. It tends to accumulate in specific sites. Uh, and this uh, will uh, stop further lava flows uh, until this inflation process begins. So the, the crust that forms uh, uh, gets inflated vertically and as I was stating before, you can see this um, linear fracturing that develops uh, along the direction of the flow. So these, these cracks can go for, for significant distances. This must be on the order of 500 meters. And um, the cracks can open up laterally quite extensively. So in this case, they are on the order of a meter and um, yeah sometimes these will collapse um, and you have a fallout uh, so you have breakages forming and accumulation on the more depressed domains uh, this is an example of the mccarthy's lava flow in new mexico scientists have sort of studied extensively how this has evolved uh, and um, as I said, you, you, you have fairly thick lobes forming uh, with uh, sometimes almost 20 meters uh, in terms of thickness of the, these features. These are other examples from the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, so we have the Kalapana, which is near uh, the uh, southern part, I think, of the, of the uh, Hawaiian island on the U.S. side. And um, this image is showing a characteristic type of lava, which is called Pahoyoy, and corresponds to the more fluid lava. Many times you form... Uh, um, this lava tend to spread laterally extensively and form lamine of relatively thin lavas uh, and since these tend to cool very rapidly and form a crust uh, they often get uh, extremely viscous uh, towards these, the end of the uh, solidification process uh, 
the movement of the lava is still significant and it will form plastically forming this, this type of ridges uh, which are commonly defined ropey textures because they resemble ropes uh, as you see here uh, so it looks like there are fibers on the crust uh, instead these are different uh, folding taking place as in drapes uh, um, of tissue on, on the crust of, of, of this uh, um, flow and this is quite characteristic of, of the Pahoi Hoi. The second type is the double uh, A lava. So AA lava is more blocky. You have here a comparison between uh, a Pahoi Hoi lava. You can see it's much more smooth uh, and thin, and then it gets thicker and blocky on this. Uh, right side here where this contact is and quite often that's a good evidence that the lava has changed its behavior so it's breaking into small fragments uh, and you start to thicken up the lava flow and quite often you start to form uh, lava that flows underneath uh, this uh, blocky crust uh, so the change in behavior is also in terms of velocity a, a lavas usually are much slower, they don't really flow uh, efficiently as Paoi Hoi, but at the same time uh, they are more dangerous because uh, they are uh, difficult to deviate, so if you cannot really use uh, artificial um, excavations to guide the flow of the lava, which is a solution that is commonly adopted to prevent damage to building and human life uh, when you are facing lava flows in the Hawaiian islands of this type, so the Pahoi Hoi. So these are less dangerous because of that. We will see that we have, when you get high with the viscosity, they get even more blocky these lavas and get even more um, sort of dense and thick and in response to that it becomes very very tricky really to stop uh, and so you have to have people abandon villages that are affected by this type of lavas um, there is even more uh, acidity on the magma so often that leads to other types of um, eruptions that are more explosive and we will see that these lavas if compared to those ones are better and less dangerous because they allow for the liberation of gases which are usually liberated dominantly at the source in the lava lakes so remember Paoyoi it's the first one is more fluid and then you have your double A lavas and if in the extreme cases we can talk about blocky lavas as well here is a section through a ropey lava we see uh, basically these ridges forming which are curvilinear ridges they are essentially a process of refolding of the crust that takes places in, in two distinct directions. So you firstly form a, a first curvature and then you have a refolding that is linked to the differential movement of the magma under the crust, which is pushing more on this axis and less on this other front and so this is why you get this curvature often entrained in the paoi oi uh, you get all sort of fragments of pre-existing lava that are illustrated in here are very angular and uh, uh, represent a, a key aspect of these ropey textures uh, this is an example from Myocenic basalts of the Big Bang Kesnell.
in British Columbia, so north, roughly two or three hundred kilometers north of uh, uh, Vancouver. These are eruptions that are uh, some among the most recent, really, that occurred in British Columbia. They are only 270 years old. And um, this, actually, this eruption was quite, quite uh, remarkable, pretty much similar to the uh, most prominent eruptions that occurred in uh, southern Italy. Uh, near Naples, which are uh, commonly referred to as the Vesuvian eruption because they are linked to Mount Vesuvius. Uh, but these are much older. We are referring to eruptions that are more than 2,000 years old. So it's important to realize that uh, these flows can be even more extensive, especially if they are associated with intracontinental rifting. Many times you have uh, that these basalts are relatively fluid, uh, and so if your hot spot uh, is affecting continental crust, uh, often it exploits the topography and uh, extends sometimes for thousands of kilometers, like this example in the Washington state. Uh, dominantly, I mean, it's at the boundary between Washington, Idaho, and, and Oregon. And uh, yes, we have the Monument Dyke Swarms uh, and the Chief Joseph Dyke Swarms as examples. So you can see these are linear features. The colors here represent sets of dike in red, and these are volcanic centers in blue. So often we find a manifestation of these uh, in relationship to the famous uh, hot springs uh, in the Yellowstone Park. And um, also you see these massive accumulations of basalts um, uh, that have been carved by the Columbia River over the centuries, really. So you have these vent locations where you form these uh, degassing, so the geysers. Uh, and uh, yes, you can think of these as a big intrusive of basaltic magma uh, that uh, uh, sort of melts or remelts the existing continental crust uh, so the continent that is on top uh, and you get this extension because of that uh, and form the Yellowstone caldera on top so lots of rec recirculation of it which is still active today is causing an initial rifting and subsequently you have deposition at the surface of these uh, massive basaltic flows. Um, quite often in these scenarios you have bimodal magmatism, which is a function of the portion of, of partial mantle that take place uh, um, at the crustal levels. Um, so, um, other aspects I think uh, I've addressed more and uh, we will talk about these extensional rifts a little bit more in, in in another lecture so we can move to the next one uh, which is still the same i think so it's another example at even larger scale that shows uh, an important concept uh, which is equivalent to what we saw for the hawaiian islands uh, so if this is the o washington oregon boundary you can see uh, the distribution of of this massive plateau uh, and this is the, the n2 grande ronde flu unit uh, which is comprises approximately 21 flows uh, how do you get such uh, sizes uh, uh, so it's you have to relate this back to the discussion we were having on, on hotspots. If you have hotspots that are sitting on continental crust, uh, it's pretty much the same procedure. So you have a single source in the mantle and progressively the upper crust is moving on top of the asthenosphere. And this movement leads to uh, 
a sequence of provinces which record different uh, ages. So in here you have the ages, so the oldest here and the youngest is here. And so you have essentially a movement of the plate that then gets bended and, and you continue with, uh, with the plate till present day basically. Some examples here of, of the typical texture of a basalt. So you can see this is mostly aphanitic in the sense that you don't recognize uh, the shape of the minerals. So, so it's a relatively fine, fine grain rock. You might have some uh, uhydra crystals, and quite often these phenocrysts. Uh, are um, leading to naming this a porphyric basalt. Um, but yeah, dominantly the matrix will be glassy and you will not be able to easily see the mineralogy. However, by knowing uh, uh, the rock type, you uh, straight away know that it contains 50% plagioclase and 50% pyroxene with some accessory minerals like olivine or amphibole sometimes uh, um, sometimes even mineralization is present uh, and so you can recognize copper accumulations and they can assume these flowery textures which are termed copper blooms uh, here is another example of basalt but it's more olivinic so a more uh, epicritic composition will be like this, more greenish in color. And you can see major phenocris, which are mafic phenocris. Uh, and this will be pyroxene or amphibole. Many times we will have to check the cleavage, but looking at the, the basal section here, since this is square, it's more uh, looking like these are pyroxens. Um, sometimes uh, these rocks uh, tend to have bubbles or pockets of voids uh, that are related to rapid degassing. So if uh, the lava flows get to surface and it contains quite a bit of volatiles, the decompression uh, tends to form these uh, bubbles um, which get solidified and preserved in the basaltic rock. Secondary processes often fill the gaps uh, and these form what are called amygdalae, I would say. And so this is because you call it uh, an amygdal amygdaloidal basalt uh, because it's represented by this uh, characteristic texture. The bubbles are filled with cement. This cement can be uh, identified with similar techniques to what done uh, for the minerals that we saw. Sometimes these are filled with quartz, so they will be extremely hard. Uh, it could be filled with carbonates, so it will react to HCl. Or it might have... Uh, um, a clay aspect so it will be very soft and non-reacting to HCl. This is a slightly older example from the Proterozoic so one example could be an age around 1.8 to 1.5 billion years. It comes from uh, the Michigan state uh, in USA and uh, uh, I think what is characteristic you can see still a rock that is aphanitic but uh, small amygdala are evident in this part of the specimen as well as this other location and you see a characteristic pistachio color uh, so a mineral called epidote uh, which is uh, mostly a, a mineral that comes in rhombic or monoclinic uh, 
uh, symmetry will be uh, quite common in alteration products uh, of felspar, for example. Other examples of structures that are quite often found in basalts uh, are these pillows, um, so pillow lavas uh, on the left side, which are often similar to boulders, uh, although these have a three-dimensional structure and often are quite elongated laterally and they form essentially tubu tubular shaped bodies uh, and uh, you have a better example um, down here uh, uh, which explains the mechanism of formation of the pillow lavas. These are submarine, submarine deposits of lava. It is essentially the product of the interaction of seawater with uh, uh, a lava flow uh, which is uh, resulting in the formation of rapid uh, glassy crusts. Okay, so glassy crusts uh, will form all around uh, the uh, injection, and because of that, uh, you have a slow cooling that takes place. So you form essentially a crust that protects uh, the lava inside uh, the pillow. On this side, uh, and these pillows usually are, are from the centimeter to several meters in, in, in scale, like this example here. Um, on this side, we have another example of lava flows uh, that uh, are quite often found in uh, mid-oceanic ridges, uh, quite often where you have the ingress of lava Usually the contact with seawater can form a contraction, cooling related fractures. Uh, and these are some examples of columnar jointing. Quite often uh, uh, these are orthogonal to uh, surface. Uh, so the isotherms usually, uh, so the lines that connect points of, at the same temperature will be often normal to the columnar jointing while cooling progresses from the top of the lava flow downward you get that the, you form this cracking that is an extensional cracking unfortunately sometimes the flow will be more complicated and this is linked to again the asymmetry that can form in the distribution of isotherms within the lava flow and this causes uh, a differential contraction which uh, uh, results in sets of sheeted dikes uh, with different uh, orientation. Actually, these are uh, columnar jointing fractures, so they're not dikes. Uh, and uh, they will essentially firstly form as a single flow, and then you get this set of joints uh, that form within the lava flow more correctly. Living um, the shield volcanoes and all the basaltic lavas and rather focus on uh, more silicic magmas. So this quite often lead uh, to the formation of what uh, is called a stratovulcano. Stratovulcanoes, uh, as the names uh, uh, alludes to, they are composed of multiple layers of products. Uh, we still have uh, lavas, but usually these are much more uh, silicic uh, and they quite often are uh, forming intervals. So we have lavas here in purple, but in green we have uh, cinerites uh, or pyroclastic deposits. Uh, so these are composed of multiple strata essentially, which will have a variable amount of silica and they will result for a number of processes. Uh, we will review more in detail these processes. It's uh, just uh, at the moment important to realize that uh, you have different phases in a stratovulcano, and this will result in different types of uh, uh, eruptions. Uh, this other example, uh, I think from California, is um, 
yes, in the Cascade Range in Northern California is the Brokoff Volcano, which is um, the highest peak here on, on, on the left. And uh, yes, this peak uh, uh, is the uh, essentially the highest for, for the western part of this uh, volcanic complex. Uh, and um, it essentially began activity on the order of 600,000 years ago and this activity was protracted uh, until 400 to up to 350,000 years ago. Um, yes, the elevation reached on the order of 3,350 meters uh, just to give you the feeling of the size and scale and it's roughly 12, 12 kilometers um, so it's rather small if compared to a shield volcano, as we were uh, mentioning earlier. Uh, it's also more complex. The edifice of this volcano has seen uh, a switch in the magmatism from the western part uh, to this eastern part, where we have uh, the more, more recent formation of Eagle Peak and, and Lassen uh, Peak, which are uh, essentially volcanic lava domes uh, that uh, uh, represent very siliceous magmas that uh, form uh, spine-like uh, bodies uh, just on top of the feeder systems. Uh, um, so it's, it's quite interesting geometry because uh, you can uh, witness uh, uh, the effect of the interaction of hydrothermal activity and erosion. So originally uh, this volcano was much higher. You can see with the arch line the original interpretation of, of the uh, morphology of the crater. So morphology is, is quite important. Remember that uh, uh, stratovolcanoes are much steeper if compared to the um, shield volcanoes. So they are smaller and also the cone is, is far more steep uh, uh, and this is uh, um, also why they get eroded more easily. If we look at smaller cones, uh, often uh, for these uh, we refer to a variety of morphologies uh, which are again a response to the style, style of volcanism and the relationship with, with erosion. These uh, smaller structures are commonly the result of uh, localized activity. For example, on a shield volcano, we mentioned that we can have, uh, have flank eruptions. Uh, these can be locally forming smaller cones, uh, which are commonly defined as uh, scoria cones or cinder cones. And uh, these features usually have a diameter that goes from 0.25 to up to 2.5 kilometers. Uh, you have uh, an image here that shows you the stratification of, of scoria, which are essentially fragments uh, of lava, of basaltic lava that uh, uh, are so characteristic of these uh, relatively uh, non-explosive activity. Other structures are termed MAR and these are more diatrem-like features. If you remember when we were mentioning the kimberlites, uh, we discussed the structure of kimberlites uh, and um, these are, are similar, so you have uh, often MAR forms uh, because of the interaction of water with the magma chamber. So it leads uh, to uh, pyroclastic explosions uh, that form uh, essentially layers of cinerites, so much finer grain products, uh, which are ashes, volcanic ash, so very glassy materials that uh, have pretty much a similar size, so 0 0.2 up to 3 kilometers. Uh, um, other types of, of uh, even more explosive features are the tooth rings uh, 
and the tooth cones. Um, and these are entirely represented uh, by cinerites uh, and they lack the diatrem that is present in the mar in the center of, of, of a mar because these features are not really related to water. So there is a minimal interaction. So you don't have phreatum aquatic uh, eruptions. Uh, so you don't get a very large crater like uh, in the mar example. This is an example of the scoria cone I was mentioning, so relatively small, small feature. You can see quite often uh, lava activity in the middle with the gassing. And so uh, the lava is quite fluid, as you can see, uh, from this lava fountain that is uh, forming within the crater. Uh, but yeah, it's a small crater and the nature of the crater is very blocky. So lots of fragments of scoria accumulates and represent the main, um, the main product that sort of support uh, these flanks. Um, however, the crater is uh, not a stratovulcano, okay? So it's made up of a single product, really. Uh, this is an example of, of a scoria enlarged. So you can see here the coin as a scale. And so micro bubbles will form in the scoria and it, and it will make the scoria very similar to a pumice. Uh, however, usually the scoria is dark in color because of the basaltic composition and it's quite heavy. One thing I didn't mention is the fact that if you put uh, a piece of scoria in water, it will not float. Instead, uh, one of the characteristics of of uh, Plinian eruptions, uh, uh, which are eruptions that involve pyroclastic flows, uh, is that they ej the ejecta uh, often are found floating in seawater and so in the ocean. So you find these pumice uh, floating on the surface, a good indication of the fact that it's very low density material, so much different and usually white in color. So pumice is much lighter in color, gray or white. So the mar is, is essentially a broad volcanic crater cut uh, below the pre-eruption surface in older material with a shape somewhat between a funnel and a shallow dish. And mars formed by the blasting out of older material during a steam-driven explosion. Uh, so to produce steam, of course, you need an interaction of water with magma. And then you have collapses that can take place, so you form a caldera. And uh, because of that, you must have a shallow magma chamber uh, that sort of interacts with, with seawater. You can see here a very large crater, so much more extensive. Another example here of very large crater and certainly this is a good uh, indication of the explosivity of, of this type of eruptions that leads to a development of, of uh, much uh, prominent uh, um, or more extensive uh, uh, products. Uh, so the accumulation of, of uh, cinerites on the side is, is more pronounced, although these features are more depressed. Uh, and they have essentially a smaller slope if compared to a cinder cone. And uh, yeah, tooth cones and uh, tooth rings uh, kind of form a continuum with uh, the scoria cones. Uh, in scoria cones, the ratio of the eight to basal diameter is approximately a third, which essentially uh, repeats what I was mentioning, they are much steeper. Usually the tooth rings uh, and tooth cones uh, are usually less than one to five. And the volume of, of the crater space will be larger uh, because you have a larger volume of ejecta. So if we focus on the types of pyroclastic uh, flow deposits, uh, 
I would say we can distinguish four main types and these are based on a number of eruptions that uh, have been sort of iconic uh, in the history of volcanism uh, on, the, on our planet. Um, the first one is the one of the Pinatubo vul Volcano, uh, which is in, uh, in the Philippines. Uh, and um, it's kind of a classic Plinian eruption. So you have essentially a collapse of a vertical explosive or Plinian column, which is this uh, extensive tephra here uh, that gets higher born and then are dropped basically on the sides uh, for uh, you know tens of kilometers distance really and uh, yes in this particular eruption we have both uh, the fall so pyroclastic flow falls as well as uh, uh, basal surges that uh, essentially represent major currents depositing uh, sediment at really high speed and they are also very hot uh, quite often and uh, contain um, very harming gases uh, uh, so essentially it's, it's enabled really to sustain life when a, a surge reach a particular location so they essentially are very destructive processes um, other examples are the Mont saint Helene in, in the states uh, so in the Rockies uh, this eruption is fairly recent I think it's it was in, in the 80s um, and uh, is essentially the result of a guided blast uh, so a lateral blast uh, that uh, um, is con was conditioned by the presence of a lava dome so sometimes when you have really silicic magma you tend to form a cap on uh, on the main crater and this uh, uh, will have effect in terms of the di direction of of the basal surges um, and uh, in this particular case I, I recall also the presence of of a lake so lava lakes uh, uh, sorry not the lava lake it's just a water lake on, on the crater which leads uh, to um, um, the production of particular type of mixtures of essentially water with the cinerites uh, which can form lahar activity and so you have major mud flows that are really dense uh, that uh, are part of this uh, 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 expulsion of, of products from the volcano and they often have uh, really destructive power as well in the sense that they can flatten out in entire forests as it happened for for the Santa land so very abrupt very very substantial activity uh, that uh, leads to major changes in uh, the vegetation and geomorphology of an area like this one in in the states um, um, Boiling over cases, this example from Lamington in Papua New Guinea is also quite important. It illustrates that sometimes you, you don't have that kind of highly silicic lavas, so the activity is less explosive. Uh, so you have lower columns, not really as the Plinian example but you still produce a basal surge so you might have situation where only a basal surge occurs and you don't have major fallouts uh, and the last one is when you have uh, extremely silicic uh, uh, magma so the Mont Pelé which is in Martinique uh, so in the Caribbean um, was actually extremely uh, devastating and um, is actually one of the key uh, types of, of eruption that involves uh, the destabilization of, of a spine basically so you have a volcanic spine so which is a very dense uh, protrusion that sometimes uh, sink into the crater and causes the release of massive amount of gases because 
it's essentially destabilizing the, the, the magmatic chamber. So you have pressure release, and this usually causes boiling and liberation of massive masses of, of, of uh, basal surges of extensive uh, uh, size. So the gravitational collapse of a hot dome is certainly something that is very destructive. Uh, and these are some examples of the extent uh, to which these products can, 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 can reach. And as you see here, they, they sometimes reach thousands of kilometers, although they form relatively thin blankets uh, of ashes. Some examples here of volcanic ash uh, that is covering some old cars, likely in the 60s or maybe the 70s or 80s. Here is an example of a tooth ring, so you can see it's much steeper. This is in, in Hohao, in the Big Island, in Hawaii. And so you had uh, essentially uh, a major explosion, probably related to seawater. Uh, so a fre phreatomagmatic activity taking place. Uh, and in response to that, uh, you form a major accumulations of basaltic products on the sides. Uh, uh, and so you form this classical diamond-shaped uh, 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 crater, and that's why it's, it's probably called this this way. In terms of uh, fine uh, grain matter, you can see that uh, a tooth is effectively represented by an aphanitic texture. And this is a, a, an example of Dorian Ontario. So we had also in, in the state of Ontario significant volcanic activity. And this led to the formation of the onapin, onapin tooths. And um, in this case, you know, it's very hard to distinguish the mineralogy. But uh, we know that tooths are extremely silicic. Uh, so this uh, likely is very quartzitic so it does contain quite a bit of quartz so a very glassy texture with uh, some additional fragments uh, uh, which could have also a silicic composition uh, there might be also some amygdals in this tooth uh, because of the loba lobated shapes uh, that i can see in this uh, specimen and so they could be filled by carbonates as well. Here is another example. This is more fragmental. So this composition is more rhyolitic. Many times rhyolites will be pinkish, reddish, or white in color. So you have this paste of cinerites and fragments of glass that are quite evident and illustrate the high siliceous composition of, of uh, the tooth, uh, which is more breccia-like, so you do have very angular fragments uh, of glass uh, in this case. Uh, um, some products of oxidation are more representative of these reddish spots in, in this rock, uh, and uh, I attribute them to a later phase of uh, um, alteration of the tooth. Uh, you can see sometimes the clast will uh, show concentric uh, features uh, and these concentric features sometimes uh, are um, concretionary lapilli, accretionary lapilli actually. So they will form, we will see some example of those features that uh, they, they tend to to form uh, um, uh, while um, the ejecta or the tefla are expelled uh, and it's when they are suspended essentially in the column or in the eruptive column. So the interaction with water droplets uh, on the eruptive column and, and, and cinerites uh, can form this con concretionary lapilli. An example of pumice, so this will be very porous, so you can see a lot of uh, pores like 
we saw for the scoria but the rock is much more whitish in color and very glassy and light and this example comes from uh, the tertiary and it's in Utah in the state so the black rock uh, accumulation uh, this is a, a rhyolite from from Ontario again very very light colored and very glassy uh, looks like a quartzite to me probably this rock has been metamorphosed and in fact you f you can recognize also traces of sulfides uh, in this specimen which are a secondary product of alteration of, of, of this rock. So Plinian explosive eruptions are of course related to highly silicic magmas so you have dust city to rhyolitic lavas quite commonly forming and uh, uh, these are linked to the early feature we were mentioning uh, so the stratovulcanos uh, Sometimes the rhyolite will be reddish in color, as I was mentioning, and you can uh, also recognize dark minerals in the rhyolite. You have to think at the Strachasian diagram, and since we have a highly silicic rock, uh, quite often we, the mineralogy of the mafix uh, will be uh, according to the Bowen fractionation sequence suggesting the presence of biotites and in fact these are actually plugs of biotites you can see a pseudo hexagonal form here and uh, the dark nature and they they scratch easily so if you use a copper coin you'll be able to scrape off some of these biotite uh, plugs uh, and so remember that the biotite is a phyllosilicate, so uh, it's really too easy to break the bonds on the single cleavage that this mineral has. And this is a porphyry instead, so it's a crowded texture. Uh, often uh, you see a lot of crystals uh, in here of uh, uh, felspar that uh, will touch their edges and they are disseminated in a finer grain uh, matrix uh, and there is also again the pseudo hexagonal plugs of biotite so it's um, essentially a combination of felsix uh, and mafix uh, that gives these characteristic porphyric textures uh, and these come again from, from tertiary in Colorado USA so um, it's quite unique example of rhyolite more grayish in color and this sort of suggests that you have to be careful when you are assessing um, the nature of a volcanic lava you want to make sure that you understand the mineralogy that is well evident and quite often is based on the understanding of what phenocris you have and based on that you can make a decision about uh, uh, the uh, classification of that particular lava. Uh, in this case the abundance of biotite, uh, uh, the evidence of, of uh, plagioclase or uh, K-felspar, so we don't know what this felspar is, but uh, maybe if we look carefully we can find often glass shards uh, in, uh, in these tooths uh, and uh, um, rhyolites uh, that will uh, allow an easier classification because if there is free glass uh, biotite and felspar well you are in a good position to think that this is a rhyolite uh, instead if you have an andesite these dark minerals could be dominantly amphibole for example and that would be a good good indication that you're dealing with with an andesite uh, lava Many times uh, we get different shapes uh, for uh, these domes. So in some instances, if uh, the lavas are extremely basic, uh, you will get seals uh, like the examples that we saw in Spain uh, in, uh, in one of the uh, 
earlier lectures. Uh, um, other cases will form lacolites, uh, so mushroom-like, uh, um, essentially inflation uh, of the adjacent rocks. Uh, and then we have lopolites, which are instead mimicking the uh, stratigraphy of the surrounding host rock. And then other things like diatrams uh, uh, will form either funnel-like geometries or dikes, uh, which are more tabular and maintain a constant thickness, and they are sub-vertical. Instead, remember the seals are exploiting pre-existing stratigraphy quite often, and they, they will essentially parallel stratigraphy. And then you have these pipes or diatrams, so diamond-rich kimberlites uh, often have these pipes at the bottom of the diatram, and this leads to these verticalized channels that are quite narrow. So if you remember, when we were talking about the kimberlines, we, we said that they are relatively small features, so difficult to find in the field and on the order of a few hundred meters, really. Here is a, a, a method of formation for the lacolite to clarify the process. Uh, if you remember when we were discussing about the basaltic magmas, we said that uh, often the magma rises and uh, since it's very fluid, uh, it will tend to infiltrate pre-existing structures. So if you are infiltrating a sedimentary complex, Quite often, this is characterized by a stratification that is sub-horizontal. So the stratification is exploited by the magma progressively, and because of that, you get essentially an inflation and the development of an anticline or a dome on top of uh, the magma chamber. And so the accumulation of magma progressively changes the morphology of, of this sedimentary strata and forms uh, a number of radial fractures around uh, the lacolite. So the lacolite, lacolite is uh, a mushroom-like uh, intrusion that uh, quite often is hypabyssal because you need uh, essentially the intrusive to come to a, a relatively shallow level to be able to exploit the stratigraphy and essentially um, create the space um, to allow uh, the intrusion to develop uh, so you don't have to have a lot of lithostatic pressure otherwise it, the process becomes very challenging um, so a lacolite is an, an inflated seal basically with a planar floor and an upward arch or partly faulted roof uh, other examples here of forms of volcanic forms uh, uh, that uh, are quite often identified in, uh, in the field. Sometimes uh, the um, uh, volcanic uh, eruption will produce a discordant sheet uh, or uh, essentially dikes uh, that uh, are infiltrating pre-existing discontinuities. We saw some, some examples earlier. Uh, these can can be totally random or they might be um, related to the geometry of, of the pipe. So if that's the case, you will form more radial features. So often if you are mapping in the field, you are able to identify a pipe if you look at the distribution of uh, radial dikes, for example. In other cases, like uh, in intercontinental rifting, Quite often, as we saw for Colorado, we form a parallel sets of dikes, uh, and these are commonly called dike swarms. And um, this will be, again, quite often dolerites, uh, so basaltic compositions are common, or diabase dikes, uh, so pretty much, again, basalts uh, that are uh, porphyric sometimes, uh, because uh, they can uh, uh, crystallize in in hypabyssal setting, and then the erosion exposes them. Um, other cases will see the formation of ring dikes uh, and cone sheets. Uh, 
and so these are classified differently depending really on the uh, form of these uh, uh, radial dikes they are different from from the radial dikes that are orthogonal to the pipe as we saw before in the sense that uh, they are usually related to a distinct process here it's more tensional fracturing that occurs because of the intrusion here is instead the change in pressure in relationship to a retreat of the magmatic chamber so here you have arrows indicating a progressive collapse so when you form a caldera quite often you have a collapse and the caldera rings tend to form and these are essentially um, openings that follow the shape the curvilinear shape of the crater and they get infilled by secondary volcanics uh, and this will be your ring dikes cone sheets form for the opposite process so the flowery tendency of these uh, is a function of a pressure um, that is exerted by a magmatic uh, a chamber that is rising and so uh, you get a different geometry but the principle is the same you open up space uh, that is, get, is filled by, by volcanic products so this is a more uh, sort of detailed representation of a diatrem it does illustrate uh, the mixing that occurs within uh, this uh, uh, tooth ring so usually at the top you have a tooth ring and then you generate uh, depressions related to the volcanic activity that involves brecciation of the host so you form host fragments that get mixed with xenolites uh, and that are uh, essentially ejected from deeper levels so uh, here you have an example of a hyperbisal dike seal that is usually at the base of the diatrem and here you have a variety of facies really that are characteristic of, of the diatrem so this includes lateral infiltrations of magmas and uh, the mixing so you have an area where you get mixing that uh, uh, involves again the um, fragments that are detached from from the side together with uh, the um, primary magmatic products uh, so the cinerites so diatrams are pipes or narrow funnel shaped bodies filled with accidental and gas charge juvenile magmatic material the juvenile, juvenile material is kimberlite or chemically related volatile rich alkaline mafic or, or to ultramafic rock at surface uh, the diatrem terminates as a mar or a, a tooth ring basically here you see a picture that shows uh, the variety of, of magmatism that is present in a diatrem and so you have uh, a number really of, of exposed uh, rock types so we have cyanites granite and granitic dikes likely uplights and also rhyolite so this is a quite uh, acidic uh, diatrem in reality because of this uh, uh, variety of rock types however you have uh, a troctolite um, ring, ring dike uh, that surrounds this uh, um, diatrem and also you have more uh, ultramafic products uh, which are these anorthosites and leucograbo cabro varieties which are found uh, near the vicinity of the center of the crater and on, on the side so the, it looks like this, uh, uh, this diatrem had uh, significant phases of volcanism and so a bimodal volcanism which could be the result of different levels of, of magma being ejected and uh, interacting with, uh, with this diatrem
Here is an example of Xenolith. In this case, it's an ultramafic rock because it's dominated by uh, olivine. You can see the classical green of olivine crystals and the fact that is associated with dark minerals uh, that are your uh, pyrox pyroxens. Um, so you've got pyroxen, uh, some light minerals uh, that are likely an orthosite, so uh, plagioclase, and also there are more greenish varieties that could be diopside, so this part here seems to have some, some diopside uh, in it. Um, here is an illustration of, of um, different uh, forms uh, of, of pipes, uh, uh, and sometimes um, uh, these uh, uh, apophyses are detached from, from a larger batulit. Uh, so quite often in silicic complexes you tend to form what is called a stalk, uh, which is similar to a diatrem, but it lacks uh, the uh, explosive cone on top. You rather form ring dikes uh, or uh, a volcanic neck, which is essentially highly silicic, uh, spine the form on top of this stock and you have also your radial dikes on the side this is more the basaltic example with the seals forming together with the vertical dikes some examples of these come from the spanish peaks in colorado uh, with a clear uh, radial pattern and you see here the effect of erosion with the spine and one of the radial dikes that have been exposed because you have essentially eroded the weaker rocks and left the more silicic spine. Um, so it's an eroded remnant of a volcanic neck with the radial dikes. And this is located in New Mexico. Um, here is another example of latite. So the Spanish peak is characterized by these uh, relatively intermediate rocks. So latite is uh, usually very low in uh, uh, quartz. And so you start to have foid, foids present in, in these rocks which you can recognize because they are quite rounded and white in color and so it's likely your leucite or nepheline which is another good indication that you are in a rock that is really low in silica so these lava are quite um, dense anyways so they contain quite a bit of silicate uh, although in a different form and they will therefore produce uh, these massive plugs. So it doesn't really need to be extensively silicic. The important thing is that you are forming silicates, uh, which will increase the viscosity of the magma. Here is another example. Uh, I think it's from Greenland and uh, it's uh, the major um, dike swarm that, uh, that formed uh, through um, a zone of, of rift. I think this is a major rifting event uh, that has characterized uh, the Kangamut dike swarm uh, in uh, uh, the Sondre Stromford region in southeast Greenland. So it's in form, it's, it's quite interesting to see the different generations of, of dike swarms in this example, and you can recognize them because they have different orientations. So we have a group here that is more north, northeast oriented, and this other is rather more. Uh, sets of dikes that are being deformed to different orientation here you have even sigmoidal features that indicates uh, uh, to a certain extent uh, a uh, 
a strike slip deformation taking place uh, has reoriented some of the dikes uh, so you have major shearing domains uh, that are likely uh, resulting from a north-south compression um, so strongly deformed and reoriented dikes uh, locally little deformed sinking and matting dikes are present and then you have slightly deformed and reoriented dikes and mainly undeformed dikes um, so this legend gives you essentially a summary of what i mentioned it's illustrating the type of orientations and the relative age uh, usually younger dikes are straight and undeformed um, and you have other information here with respect uh, to the trace and dip of of the dikes which will be marked on this geological map so important to remember that in uh, extensional provinces like mid oceanic ridges you can form in continental settings uh, so if the, the oceanic ridge go across a continent uh, and you have uh, major extension and rifting that affects the continent well in that case you can develop massive amounts of dike swarms here is an example of a caldera we mentioned the caldera when we were talking about the mars and so it's showing you essentially what happens in a plinian era eruption so you have an initial sort of phase with uh, the classic uh, mm, ash fall and then you have collapse um, of some of the segments and formation of a depression in uh, in the main uh, uh, edifice uh, and this uh, of course leads to further activity and the development of pyroclastic flows because of this rapid change in pressure exerted on the magmatic chamber so in essence you have cycles of volcanic activity in response to tectonism and magma water interaction which will cause this freato magmatic eruption that we already mentioned in the Mar case um, so you have here the water um, present inside this depression that formed through uh, the caldera development uh, due to tectonics and this is filled with a, di a set of diatrems in this case uh, with the variable composition so juvenile products uh, as well as fragments from the surrounding host rock uh, and then you have uh, a central island that uh, will commonly form uh, that uh, is the result of the, the uh, products accumulated during ex explosion uh, an example here of, of uh, a caldera in the Galapagos Highland. Uh, so you can see here the type of fracturing that develops and the relative instability with different levels and, and a central lake uh, that has formed. Um, so prone to fre freatomagmatic uh, activity in this case. Uh, uh, other types of, of, of uh, fractures, so an a more detailed explanation of what I mentioned earlier, so development really of, of a variety of curvilinear fractures can often uh, sort of form these characteristic ring dikes, uh, which will be either a response of a depression of the magmatic chamber or uh, rather the result of, of an uplifting uh, like this example of mole in Scotland uh, so you will recognize this because of this concentric nature of the different uh, sort of phases of, of um, eruptions um, of acid products in this case uh, and this is another example with uh, the cone sheets uh, so a case in which you are pushing up uh, basically the magmatic chamber and you form this concentric features again so remember a plutonic emplacement so a magmatic chamber that develops uh, will uh, lead to significant uh, changes 
you have doming wall rock assimilation so the magma interacts with the wall rock and it will cause contact metamorphism and then you have ductile deformation that takes place and also other processes like uh, rock displacement uh, on the on the flanks uh, folding and uh, again emplacement uh, in, in a variety of, of environment will result in different types of, of deformation really uh, so see here is an example of how you, what we call assimilation so the magma can get injected on the sides on the uh, on the flanks of of uh, the magmatic chamber and it will interact differently with the, with the host rock so you can get injection permeation so it's like exploiting the porosity of the rock or a mixture of those processes uh, which essentially leads to the dismembering of, of part of of the uh, host rock uh, that is being subject to the uh, eruptive processes some terminology here are for for the batolites, uh, quite often you have the formation of cupolas, which are a sort of small scale protrusions on the top of a magmatic chamber, together with uh, a local diking, so offshoots of, of the main, main uh, intrusive. And then you have sort of fragments that, uh, uh, of the um, ostrach that gets entrained within the magmatic chamber. So if they are entirely entrained, we will often call it uh, a roof pendant uh, if they are instead connected to the surrounding host, uh, they are uh, termed septum. Complex intrusive do exist. Often geologists are able to date uh, the intrusives, uh, so we can assign an age and they realized like in this example that you can have multiple phases um, you can also recognize them uh, if you look at the composition of the rock sometimes um, you have progressive um, deposition of magma over time that gets uh, more silicic uh, like uh, this example so similar to some of the intrusives that are found in british columbia uh, Many times uh, north of Vancouver, you have complexes that uh, often culminate with the porphyry stage, um, so very silicic magmas. Um, so in this example, you have uh, essentially a case A with uh, a marginal quartz diorite and uh, some magma, and then you have a second phase with uh, granodiorite that is intruding and then uh, you enter into a third phase uh, where you have also a half dome granodiorite that is porphyritic uh, uh, that is deposited and culminates with a cathedral peak granodiorite uh, so again more silicic magma that culminates uh, with this granitic porphyry here uh, so that's quite interesting and often these systems are associated with mineralization so the most most fractionated parts will host also significant accumulations of of sulfides um, which is worth knowing the last example here it's looking at uh, other types of of uh, activity that is associated with the, with the magma chamber uh, many, many times we, we mention hydrothermal systems. I was discussing the fact that in a more fractionated uh, intrusive, uh, like a porphyry, you can form uh, um, mineralization. So that's also an example here of that the same process. Uh, uh, when you have a protractive activity of a magmatic chamber, often you have... Uh, geothermal gradients that are quite anomalous and associated with them you have hydrothermal activity and this can lead to the formation of uh, uh, steam uh, 
and hot water lakes. And these are commonly associated with sinters, which are particular types of silicic deposits that can host hydrothermal ores. So calderas are good sites also for, for the formation of ore deposits, which is important because we will discuss some of the hydrothermal systems in, in the last part of, of this course.